uh, and thank you for inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to um, to present some um, results and some and especially our research de design uh, we carried out in last fall and the topic I want to speak on is collecting biospecimen in a long running uh, household panel session, uh, 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 panel, <laughs> lessons learned. Uh, please the first, uh, uh, okay, so I have, what um, we are, there's three, four, four, exactly four um, fundamental questions um, in COVID-19 pandemic research. First, what is the proportion of the population with antibodies against SARS-CoV-2? So this is a zero prevalence. Uh, second, what is the extent of undetected SARS-CoV-2 infections? Third, and this is more our concern from the social sciences, what are the risk and protective factors for SARS-CoV-2 infection and especially important for uh, life course researchers in the social science, what are the long-term consequences of an infection in the further life course of affected persons? And if you want to answer these questions on an empirical basis, we need some data and we need some, not any data, but specific data. First, we need a large nationwide random sample of the population with broad regional coverage as, because we know that um, the infections vary over regions. And second, we need a long running panel study capturing demographic, socioeconomic and health related factors so we can assess the impact of the infection over the life course. And third, we need to collect and test some biospecimen. Next slide, please. Uh, and our idea was, or one solution of the data problem, so to say, is uh, to use an existing longitudinal data infrastructure. And that has some pros, uh, a number of pros. Uh, first, we, uh, there's no time consuming sampling with high dropouts in the initial contacting. Uh, so we can start on an existing sample um, using an existing longitudinal data infrastructure in the social science means also that, that there is already a range of information on demographic, socioeconomic and health related issues. Third, uh, the selectivity bias resulting from selective participation can be corrected based on the existing longitudinal information. There's another positive factor, meaning that using a prospective panel allows for the monitoring of households and individuals over the following years. That, and data can be processed, documented, and made available to a broad user community within the framework of established standard procedures and formats. This is a, a very important factor so we can open up the data for the scientific community and make sure that uh, researchers can use them and use them for their own research questions. The third, the socioeconomic panel study, the next slide please, is such a nationwide longitudinal random sample score. Uh, the third core, we have two product, so to say, the sub core, this is a basic sub sample, which is, which is running since 1984. And we ask households each year. 
And we have the second product, so to say, the third innovation study, which is running since 2012. And we use this sample uh, to test new research designs, new uh, question designs, and so on. In them, we can provide around 20,000 households for such a study to, 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 uh, to, to, to answer the, the fundamental questions. And in some, we have around 32,000 individuals, um, meaning these, this is the popular, or this is, these are the individuals which are, uh, who are um, older than 18 years. And um, as you can see on the pictures, uh, the regional coverage uh, is quite good for the SEP and the SEP IS. And on the left, uh, right side, you can see the age, the distribution of age uh, category. Next slide. Um, based on these data, on this sample, we get in contact with the uh, Robert Koch Institute, which is a government institute for biomedicine in Germany. And they brought up the idea to use the SERP for testing for COVID-19 infection and antigenes. And we have also um, uh, a, uh, another collaborator, this is the Institute for Employment Research, and uh, our research, uh, our, our survey institute, Kanta, did all the field work related to our study. And uh, the idea was, in fact, um, to, to use the SERP and to add on the questions we already have and all the, in the information we already have, a extra survey uh, where we can test people uh, on uh, infection. The decision on conducting this RKI SEP study in, was made in um, May 2020. The preparations finished in September 2020, meaning we, um, we, we finalized the design, we organized financing, legal issues, survey materials, um, pre-tests, test capacities at the RKI for, te for testing for, for the infection. Um, and the basic design is uh, a supplementary mail survey from October, starting in October, 2020 until fe February, 2021. Uh, that is outside the, um, the original field time of SERP, which is between February and uh, September per year. Uh, we, hand, we sent our respondents from the SEP the, um, two materials. First, a questionnaire on infections and symptoms of corona, testing and health behavior. And the second, the new um, material or the new, the innovation within the SEP. We have a self administered, we have self administered tests for an actual corona infection, a PCR test, and a test for antibodies in the blood, meaning this is a DBS test. Next slide, please. Um, on this slide, you can see what we hand out to our uh, respondents per mail. Uh, on the other side, you see this is a questionnaire and then uh, the test sets. Uh, one for the PCR test and the second for the DBS test. Um, our respondents had to mail the questionnaires to the Survey Institute, that is Kanta, Kanta Public. They did all the data processing. The tests, they, these were self-administered tests. Uh, they had to send it to the Robert Koch Institute where all the testing and analysis of the PCR and DBS tests uh, has been done. So uh, respondents got a notification if the tests were positive or negative. Uh, in the ne negative case, they got a written report only. In the positive uh, uh, case, 
and there were no notification uh, to the health department. This is uh, according to the rules, the existing rules here in Germany. The test result on the two tests were sent to Kanta Public and the data then went to the SERP um, and will be made uh, uh, public or, or a part uh, of our Wave 37 uh, data release. The next uh, slide, please. Uh, here you can see our sample. Uh, we have uh, in some 32,000 adults in uh, around 20,000 households. And uh, at the end, 15,000 adults in uh, 9,781 9, households uh, participated in our study. Uh, and you can also see the questionnaire, 15,000 adults, were, uh, the questionnaire were um, completed by 15,000 adults, 14,700 completed a DBS test and a PCR test has been done uh, by about 14,000. Uh, we have, and we have some dropouts as we expect. We have in um, around 14,433 adults. Um, um, we, we hadn't, for, for these adults, we have no, or with these adults, we have no contact. So uh, we don't know why they were not uh, prepared or not willing uh, to, to uh, participate. And uh, there are other uh, out drops, as you can see it. Next slide, please. Um, the survey material was sent out in four tranches. So we uh, divided the 32,000 individuals in four tranches um, uh, according to their um, location. Uh, so in the federal states, and also we uh, took into account the infection incidents in, in some regions. So, um, we contacted them in two stages. First, they got a preliminary invitation letter followed by a package with the survey material. And we sent out a writ one written reminder after two weeks uh, and the post shipment of packages. So, and you can see the numbers here. And uh, we, um, uh, in some, we got a response rate of 47.9%. And 4.7 uh, refusal. Uh, next slide, please. Here you can see the refusals. And what is uh, interesting, we have uh, only very low numbers concerning the data privacy. And, and please keep in mind, these are the refusals or the, the, the reasons of the refusals of those we had contact. Uh, I mean, we had 40, around 46% of our sample, we have no contact, so we don't know anything about uh, their uh, reasons to participate or not, <laughs> not to participate. And we also have uh, some corona deniers, uh, and the, this is a very low number. Next slide, please. Um, based on this information, and based on the information we have from the from the uh, earlier waves, meaning 2019, 2018, and so on, we can identify uh, the uh, determinants of participation. Uh, on the household level, we see that uh, in uh, regions with higher incidences, we have in, in, in fact lower participation rates. Uh, those who have a chronic, um, chronic complaints, receiving health care benefits. Uh, in these households, we have higher participation rates. And when we go to the uh, individual level, uh, the household composition uh, plays a role, meaning that uh, we're in a household where there are no children, we have low participation rates. Uh, single households, uh, higher uh, participation rates, and so on. Uh, we also see that in uh, low educated um, individuals are um, uh, less prepared to participate. Uh, those with a university degree have a lower, a higher 
participation rate, uh, and so on. And these are some uh, quite interesting uh, determinants. Next slide, please. Uh, to sum up, what are the general results of our study? First of all, the ser several prevalence studies based on self-sampling in a large scale panel uh, allows for nationwide prevalence estimates. And in fact, we uh, find um, a infection rate which is higher than the official uh, infection rates. Uh, we, have, we find about 2%. Uh, and the cumulative prevalence just before the second corona wave um, is about 2%. And as I already said, this is higher than the official rates. Under reporting, uh, by the official uh, rates um, under report the infections. And uh, we also see social disparities. Uh, persons with a low educational attainment are almost twice as often affected by infections. Next slide, please. Um, what are the lessons learned? First of all, large panel studies are suitable for collecting data very quickly uh, or relatively quickly uh, if the appropriate resources are available. Second, uh, the regional prevalence evaluations with RKI uh, are only possible to a very limited extent as a regional. Um, uh, prevalence. Um, this is because we have only 30,000 individuals and, 20, uh, and uh, only 20,000 households. We wish to have, uh, like you in the UK, 40,000, uh, but still we are not uh, in such a good position. Uh, the willingness to pri provide biospecimen specimen with a long-lasting panel uh, is comparably high. I mean, we, we have 48% in the round, uh, and, uh, but there are still reservations, as you can see, that we have 46% uh, in non-contact. Um, we did, uh, uh, I mean, organizing this study and carrying out was a, a high uh, organizational effort uh, due to the, uh, to the regulations we have in Germany. We have a, a high level of data protection uh, things. We had to, to, uh, to have an ethics vote and so on and so on. That was uh, a new uh, field for us. Uh, but, um, um, but as we have learned now a lot of things, we are now planning to have a, a second uh, RKE SERP wave in October 2021 um, to get really uh, the second measurement point for this test. And here in the second wave, we now uh, focus on only on the DBS uh, test, meaning that we are uh, collecting only these, that biospecimen. Thank you very much. And I'm uh, looking forward to your questions.